Hello, and welcome to the second episode of the Warwick Podcast. I'm Laura Orris, one of the archivists working to complete the catalogue for the Greville Collection here at the Record Office. Today's topic is something a bit unusual, however the more research I do, the more fascinating it becomes. Several weeks ago, I was browsing through the catalogue for the Greville family of Warwick Castle collection, when I stumbled upon some letters from a Mr John Glennon offering the Earl of Warwick some elk antlers. Thinking this sounded a bit odd, I went and had a look at them. The first letter, a memo dated the 2nd of August 1880, says, My Lord, I beg to enclose a photograph of a perfect skeleton of Servus Megaserus. If your Lordship would be inclined to purchase the skeleton, I will forward exact measurements. I have the honour to remain your Lordship's most obedient, very humble servant, J. Glennon. Then, a week later, on the 9th of August, Mr. Glennon sent a telegram. Perfect skeleton, price including packing, £100. Property of nobleman, if offer made, I will send owner's name and address. Another memo follows a couple of days later on the 11th. My lord, I beg to enclose full particulars of the skeleton of Irish elk. I have a set of antlers of same with perfect skull and two pairs of fossil red deer's antlers, one with 16 times and the other 14 times, which I will let your lordship have for a low price owing to the scarcity of money with us at the present time. If your lordship wishes, I would send photographs of them for inspection. The skeleton is not my property. The particulars are then listed, and Mr Glennon also enclosed a drawing of the antlers, which he was selling for £39. Another memo, dated 2nd of May 1881, was addressed to Mr Mills at the castle. Sir, I have at present a good specimen of the giant Irish elk. I would sell it for £31, including packing case. And then there's one last memo from the 7th of March, 1882. My Lord, I have the honour of submitting to your Lordship a fine set of antlers, which I have at present for sale. So who was John Glennon, and why was he so keen to sell elks and elk antlers to the Earl of Warwick? A quick search on a well-known search engine shows that John Glennon came from a family of natural history dealers. His father, Richard, was a well-known naturalist, taxidermist and dealer of natural history specimens. John, as well as at least three of his siblings, all went into the family business, eventually trading from their own premises in Dublin. This isn't necessarily relevant to the Grevels, but I thought it was interesting, as I'd never really thought about the fact that selling skeletons would be a family trade. Not knowing much about giant Irish elks, or to give them their proper name, Giant Irish Deer, I went to the Market Hall Museum to find out more about them from John Radley, Curator of Natural Sciences. So here we are at the Market Hall Museum in Warwick, and behind me you can see the skeleton of our giant Irish deer. Now this particular skeleton was collected in 1866, I say particular skeleton, it's probably a composite made up of parts from um, several partial skeletons. It was collected from an Irish peat bog. Now at that time, um, back in the middle of the 19th century, the peat was being extensively dug as a source of fuel and lots of bones of these amazing extinct animals, which are about 11,000 years old, turned up. They were very, very popular in English stately homes, um, even castles and certainly museums. And uh, we're very, very lucky to have this one here preserved. So why was the Earl of Warwick in the market for so many elks and antlers? The Earl of Warwick at the time the letters were written was George Guy Greville, who was the fourth Earl. George Greville, along with his wife Anne, was a well-known collector not just of natural history specimens, but also antique furniture, books and armour. Of course, the letters we have in the collection are only the letters that the Earl received. What he might have written in reply is a mystery. In the collection, we also have several inventories of the castle, so I thought I'd have a look to see if there was a full elk skeleton. After a fairly thorough search from an inventory from around 1900, I found that there were two pairs of antlers in the billiard room. A further five sets of antlers were found in the servants' hall, along with a preserved otter, a preserved armadillo, a bull head and horns, two fawn's heads, and two deer heads and antlers. The inventory also lists eight sets of antlers in the Great Hall, however they don't mention the animal they came from, so it's possible that at least some of these were elk antlers. Then I flicked back to the servants' hall and noticed that written in red on the opposite side of the page we have a pair of elk horns on Lord Brooks Landing. Looking through the rest of the volume, it appears that the red might have been added at a later date. 
but we now know there was definitely at least one set of elk antlers at the castle in around 1900. Unfortunately, there were no full elk skeletons listed. So wondering if these antlers were still at the castle, I got in touch with Ben Kay, history team leader at Warwick Castle, to see if he was aware of an elk skeleton or any antlers lurking somewhere in the castle. Now, some of you may have come to Warwick Castle to see our wonderful Great Hall, and inside is a magnificent collection of weapons, armour, furniture and portraits. However, if you were to look up inside the Great Hall, you would see four ginormous Irish elk antlers, dating back to be roughly 10,000 years old. Now, according to our records, we have had Irish elk at the castle since roughly the early part of the 19th century. Unfortunately, in 1871, the Great Hall burns down, and with it we lost much of our magnificent collection. However, as for the Irish elk antlers, there are some more on the walls that were purchased much later on in 1875. We do not know for certain if sadly the ones from the early 19th century survived that disastrous fire. What we do know is the ones we have today, they are magnificent and the largest one on display currently has a span between the antlers tip to tip of 11 and a half feet. It seems that the Earl of Warwick never purchased a full elk skeleton. After all, it would be quite difficult to hide something so big, but he was certainly a collector of their antlers. Perhaps the fire that Ben mentioned was the catalyst behind the sudden influx of letters from John Glennon offering elk skeletons and antlers. Another document held here at the record office contains photographs of the castle before and after the fire, which occurred on the 3rd of December 1871, nine years before the first of these letters was received from John Glennon. The photographs of the Great Hall from before the fire show several specimens of elk antlers on the walls, however the photographs from after the fire was extinguished show just how much devastation was caused and there are no elk antlers in sight. While the fire was burning, some of the more valuable artwork at the castle was moved to the safety of Shire Hall, however it seems that very little from the Great Hall survived. The day after the fire, the Birmingham Daily Post and Journal reported, of the great art treasures contained in the Great Hall, nothing was saved except a fine old painting entitled The Battle of the Amazons. The large antique gun of curious workmanship captured from a Spanish ship by Lord A. Hamilton, the prodigious pair of antlers from Ireland presented by Lord Mulcastle, various excellent specimens of ancient British armour, and the knightly accoutrements proudly arranged along the walls, with the gigantic figure of a belted knight clad in a complete suit of beautiful armour composed of highly polished steel, pronounced by Gross to be the finest suit of old English armour extant, were all destroyed. As the fire was so widely reported on, it's not difficult to imagine that word got around that the Earl of Warwick might be in the market for some new elk antlers. Of course, this is pure speculation, but I had another look through the catalogue just to see if there were any other instances of elks or elk antlers appearing in the records, and it turns out that John Glennon was not the only man trying to supply the Earl with an elk. In 1878, another Dublin company, Williams and Son, wrote to the Earl. Mr Williams wrote, My lord, I have at present the largest head of the Irish elk in Dublin, nothing equal to it in any of the museums. As I understand you take an interest in such things, I take leave to direct your attention to it. Of course, we have no idea how the Earl responded, but it must have been positively, as a further letter was delivered almost a month later. My lord, I delayed answering your letter, expecting to have been able to get a photograph to send you, but did not. The largeness of the head prevented me getting it to any of the galleries. In massiveness and general size, it is quite unique, being greatly superior to the Royal Dublin Society head. The price is 60 guineas, should your lordship wish to purchase. Mr. Williams then enclosed not only a sketch of the head, but also an outline of part of one of the antlers to give an accurate impression of the size of the specimen he was trying to sell. Another letter in the collection shows that it wasn't just Dublin-based naturalists trying to sell elks. In 1884, the vicar of Hogneston in Derbyshire also took the chance to write to the earl and inquire if he knew of anyone looking for some elk heads and horns, as he had some he wanted to be rid of. He wrote, I am leaving here and wish to dispose of them and will reduce the price to £40 to effect a sale. I then found some more letters from Dublin. The first of these, dated the 1st of March 1875, is from a Mr Edward Kane. My dear Warwick, I am glad to hear that you do not wish the horns to be sent for a little time, as in this tempestuous weather they might have been knocked about and damaged. Meanwhile, I send the dimensions, as you may wish to span the panelling in the hall. Sometimes there are very fine specimens of the red deer antlers fossil belonging to the same period as the elk to be had. I do not know of any such at present, but I will be on the lookout for them if you wish. The Earl must have expressed an interest in the red deer antlers, as the next letter is from Mr Glennon again, this time to Mr Kane, written on the 16th of March 1875. 
It reads, Sir, you mentioned to me when you last called at my establishment that you wished to obtain some sets of antlers of the ancient Irish red deer. I have been offered two good sets. If you wish, you can see them at my shop. The price is £5 each pair. These antlers would pack easily with the antlers of the Servus Megaceros. A brief note scrawled on the back of this letter in a different hand is presumably from Edward Kane to the Earl. It says, would these suit you? And then is signed with the initials EC. I'm not sure who Mr Kane was, but it seems he was certainly well acquainted with the Earl, as this little note is quite informal. Several weeks later, on the 26th of April, Mr Glennon wrote to Mr Kane again. Sir, I shall go to St Wollstone's this week and pack the antlers and forward them to Warwick Castle, and shall be ready after Thursday to go to Warwick any day you mention. The boxes should not be opened until my arrival at Warwick Castle, as the antlers might be injured if unpacked by an inexperienced person. The mention of boxes suggests that the Earl might have purchased more than one set of antlers. Perhaps he decided to buy some of the red deer antlers as well. If you visit the castle today, you can see several sets of red deer antlers on the walls of the Great Hall, so it's possible these arrived at the castle at the same time. After digging a little deeper, I then found mention of some elk horns in letters from the Earl's second son, Alwyn. Alwyn was a rifleman in the King's Royal Rifle Corps, eventually gaining the rank of captain. At the time of writing these letters, he was staying in Ship Street, Dublin. On the 15th of September, 1875, he writes to his father about a possible promotion, but then changes the topic. He wrote, I hope you have heard of the safe arrival of the Elkhorns by this time. I went to Glennon's about them, and he assured me that they were all right. Since that, I have seen some splendid ones in different places, I think almost finer than ours, but they seem to be quite common in people's houses about here. Lord Powercourt has got some beauties, and a very perfect skeleton as well. It stands, I should think, seven feet high. I went down to Mr. Kane's house at St. Walston's the other day, and he showed me the only remaining pair he had of them, and I think he has certainly given you his best pair. Alwyn sent his father another letter almost two months later on the 6th of December. The letter is mostly about a possible transfer, but he writes in passing, I hope you will get the horns all safe. I told Glennon to send them. Five months passed between the letter sent by Mr. Glennon about travelling to the castle and the first of these letters from Alwyn. Were these letters about the same set, or did the Earl purchase more than one set of elk antlers from Mr. Glennon? Without knowing what the Earl wrote in his letters, it's impossible to know for sure, but from the correspondence held here at the record office, we can surmise that at least one of the four sets of antlers currently on display in the Great Hall of Warwick Castle was supplied by Mr. Glennon. The other three sets are more of a mystery. Perhaps one set came from Mr. Williams. Perhaps another came from the Vicar of Hognaston. Unfortunately, we may never know, but perhaps as we get further into cataloguing the Gravel family of Warwick Castle collection, we'll find more correspondence or even maybe some accounts that could give us a definite answer about where they came from. If nothing else, these letters show that George Gravel's reputation as a collector of natural history was widely recognised, certainly among the naturalists of Dublin. <laughs>